Very good afternoon to all of you. I am Aarti Tiwari. Um, the topic of my presentation is a deep learning approach for automatic identification of ancient water harvesting, uh, agriculture water harvesting systems. Uh, the central leg of Israel is a subtropical desert with the hot weather conditions that is uns unsuitable for the crop cultivation. There are thousands of ancient uh, 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 archaeological relics spread over the um, uh, over the area, which shows the intensive agriculture ag activity dated to the Byzantine era, mainly between fourth and seventh centuries CE. And these views were declared by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. Mapping of these archaeological uh, relics is really challenging by remote sensing because the, the width of the, um, of the walls is really smaller than the spatial resolution provided by any Earth observation space systems. And sometimes it's covered with the vegetation and sedimentation also. So it's really difficult to get a precise data with the um, remote sensing. This is, a, this is the panoramic view of the Tels Wadi. Uh, in the Wadi here, can, you can see there are two kinds of uh, uh, wall structure. One is a, uh, is a, stair ki a stair kind of a structure. These are the terraces. And one is along the Wadi. There is a wall as well. So there are two kinds of structure. One is a along Wadi terrace and other one is across Wadi terrace. And uh, this, this one is uh, uh, showing a cross section, uh, it's an agriculture plot divided by the terraces and surrounded by the side walls. And this is just a cross section view showing how the agriculture, how the vegetation has grown up uh, along the walls. So the research objective is to develop uh, a deep convolution neural network procedure for automatically recognizing ancient water harvesting systems by incorporating two remote sensing data sets and two advanced processing methods. And the specific objectives is to demonstrate a procedure uh, on uh, DCNN to automate the process of distinguishing between the multi-class features here, the sidewalls and terraces, and to evaluate the model performance. So this, I, would, I will use this pointer, I think I don't know. This is not good. So this study area, the study lies in the vicinity of the Avdat farm. This is a long-term ecological research site. And the, uh, the, 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 main, the rainfall temperature, uh, the rainfall is uh, near about, uh, uh, it's less than 100 mm. And uh, uh, in this picture here, you can see blue color uh, represents the wall and green color re represents the terraces. So this is a, just a, a presentation of how the actual terraces look like in a ground. So this is a well-exposed terraces above the ground. Here you can see a wall uh, kind of uh, structure. And this is an almost buried structure where you can just see a few uh, stones present over the area, which shows the, the presence of the uh, uh, terraces at the particular place. It's not uh, well enough to uh, in, in their actual shape. And this is showing a completely buried uh, terraces where the linear uh, line of vegetation indicates uh, their existence. And uh, this is another case, a terraces with two angular segments. <laughs> and this is uh, the broken terraces uh, present in the ground. And this is the actual side wall, a stony farm front along the wadi uh, present in the area. So the methods which I uh, applied here is uh, I used LIDAR uh, derivatives and I, uh, I used uh, object-based image analysis and machine learning. So these are the three basic uh, methods what I applied in, the, uh, in this particular objective. So object-based image analysis, there are basically two important parts for uh, the object-based analysis. One is, one is a segmentation and another one is classification. Segmentation is nothing but it's just a grouping of pixels to form an object and that object can be taken as a class sample to further classify them in an 
particular uh, object present in the area. So these are the, uh, the basic uh, difference between these. And in uh, object-based analysis, in spite of using only spectral features, we also use the uh, shape feature, texture feature, and uh, contextual features. So it's a, that's why it's a combining all the features together and giving eventually the shape of the particular object present in the area. So this is the basic advantage of using uh, object-based image analysis over pixel-based analysis. So this is one of the example here. You can see there are a, a dark, it's like a red color is showing uh, buildings. This is a, another, uh, this is one object and the pink is, Showing the surrounding area, this is a separate object. So there are basically four kind of objects with the four different colors present in the area. This is one of the example how object based looks like. So uh, to accomplish the goal of the objective, I used uh, orthophoto of uh, twelve point five centimeter and uh, uh, lidar imagery uh, from twenty twenty to twenty twenty one. And uh, a distal terrain model um, was derived uh, with the inverse distance weightening method uh, with the 12.5 with the same resolution. And DTM uh, was used to produce another uh, geomorphological feature that is slope model, profile curvature model, and flow direction model. So the data set preparation part is uh, this is uh, related to the machine learning. So in the uh, in the area there was uh, over 1500 terraces present over the uh, present over the area. The image style is a five cross uh, five twelve plus five twelve 512 pixels, uh, covering 64 by 64 meter uh, uh, in the ground. And uh, the image style was considered because uh, it was keeping in mind just to uh, just to cover at least one terraces in a single tile. So that's why this uh, image size has been taken. And total 785 uh, grid tiles were there and uh, 785 images for each of the orthophoto imagery, each of the geomorphological features, flow, flow direction model and the, and the object based classified image uh, also has been uh, taken as an input to the deep learning model. And the GPS data uh, has been collected for, uh, for actual terrace location and the route to the images Zero corresponds to the background, one corresponds to the terrace, and two is a side wall. So for the uh, object-based uh, classification, I used the vegetation as one of the features because this area is basically covered with the vegetation so and uh, the bare land. So I uh, customized one of the features that is GRVI because this is orthophoto. So we have only uh, RGB band. So uh, with the help of uh, GRVI uh, and the slope uh, model value, I classified the, um, the area into the three major classes, that is the vegetation over slope, vegetation over uh, plain, and no vegetation class. So this is an accuracy assessment pa uh, part for the classified image. Total 6,000 uh, 6, sa uh, reference samples have been uh, considered, 2,000 samples from the each class, and uh, here, uh, the classified image and the orthophotograph imagery has been uh, taken together, and uh, the uh, object statistics, that is uh, GRVI and slope, has been uh, extracted from uh, the eCognition developer. And that has been uh, um, uh, joined, especially joined with the, with the random samples present in the area. And the points, uh, those were falling at the boundary of the object that has been excluded from the accuracy estimate part. So remaining, the 4,740 samples were there. So, and then the confusion matrix has been calculated. So this is the deep learning, uh, like it's a mod modified uh, unit uh, model architecture has been applied here. So this is uh, the encoder section. And the, um, this part is a decoder section. And border section is used for the feature extraction with the help of the convolution layer, convolution layer uh, uh, um, followed by the max pooling layer to get the reduced feature map. And uh, the, uh, this portion is a decoder, is it, it uses the upsampling method with the convolution method to get the predicted mass of the, um, of the particular image object. And here, uh, uh, the results from the encoder section is being concatenated with the decoder section just to enhance the learning process. So 
training and testing data sets were mutually exclusive. So uh, all, uh, all uh, 600 sets of images has been uh, taken for the, uh, for the training and 185 kept as the test images. Here, intersection over union uh, jcard index was uh, selected to evaluate the model performance of uh, uh, over accuracy matrix and uh, the combination of the focal uh, categorical focal loss and jcard loss was used in the error measurement because this is just uh, this is a class imbalance issue most of the area is a is a bare land and vegetation so that's why this uh, uh, this combination uh, worked better in in that kind of area so i calculated this now these are the results section so this is uh, the slope and the flow direction and profile curvature. Here you can see uh, the low value uh, corresponds with the dark, the darker, and the higher with the brighter color. So these are the lidar derivatives. And this is the um, OBIS segmentation um, result. So this is uh, just one of the tile, and there are a number of tiles like that just to show how the image objects have been created. All the blue uh, line here is a small objects. Uh, based on the homogeneity criteria. And this is the object-based classification. Here you can see uh, with the with the purple color, is the uh, you can see a stair kind of a structure. Uh, vegetation is actually giving a staircase kind of structure in the area. So this is actually relevant to the uh, actual terraces present in the area. And this is the uh, confusion matrix. The overall accuracy achieved is 86%, and the kappa index is 0.79. And uh, this is the training and validation uh, intersection over union and loss curve. The blue corresponds to the training IOU, and the uh, um, uh, orange corresponds to the validation IOU score. And the mean intersection over union was obtained at uh, is a 53. Terraces uh, uh, IOU only is 33.2 and sidewall is 30.1. So these are some testing image input samples. Here you can say uh, you can see it's an input image, the corresponding ground truth mask, and the, uh, the prediction with OBIA and prediction without OBIA. So here you can see the sidewall is an actual shape we can get in, uh, with the help of the OBIA, and it's difficult to get a without OBIA. <laughs> and this is the same case here. You can see the side walls is uh, not uh, really visible without OBIA, but in OBIA, we are actually getting that shape of the side walls as well. And in this, uh, in above image, if you can see here, is uh, one of the side wall is there, and uh, sometimes it's a, it's not uh, marked in the ground truth, but it's a uh, it's a visible in a in, in it's a prediction with the OBIA model. So the model is robust enough to 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 identify the places where uh, the ground truth is missing. And here in the bottom, you can see it's a uh, terrace is broken. So uh, with the OBIA model, we are able to identify the break in the terraces as well, which is not uh, quite visible in the uh, without OBIA model. But the conclusion is uh, the mega desert is uh, covered with the tens of thousands of terraces. And the method provide archaeologists to map structures with remote sensing. Thank you. We have time for questions. I have a question. You said that you can recognize Jurassic by the by, uh, by that there is like a, a plant grown on it. Like, yes. uh, is there an explanation why is this happening? Well, just plants plants. Because, the, you know, terraces are uh, built in a way uh, for the crop production, actually. So most of the soil and rainwater, flash flood water are accumulating there most of the time. So because of that, because of the, you know, humidity all the time at the, at the walls, because it's uh, about to uh, stop this, uh, you know, just to maintain the temperature to moisture and everything for the particular crop. So I think because of that, it's getting a particular um, atmosphere to grow nearby the walls. So that might be the reason. 
there, there are situations where the river uh, gets wider, like the bank becomes wider. Like if you go towards Mitzperamon, you go down to River Tzin. And there the water, the wa uh, water velocity got, uh, is lower and there is more time for infiltration and, and uh, settlement of deposits and not nutrients. Then you get like lots of plants, but it's not because of terraces. So how do you know to distinguish between this kind of situation to with your model? We like uh, uh, there is a like uh, no, uh, soil nutrients and uh, all these together just to be because, because the bank the river bank becomes wider. So you have lower water velocity, and you have condition natural conditions that allow you these types of vegetation. Can you distinguish between that and what your model, uh, your model output? So, I mean, if I understood your question correctly, uh, it's not about distinguishing the different kind of vegetation. It's a distinguishing of only the only the terraces part, just a wall. What I understood <laughs> because I differentiated, uh, I used OBIA just to uh, extract all the vegetation along the uh, wall. It may be different kind of vegetation or depend on different kind of soil, different kind of uh, nutrients, but I'm not uh, going into the detail what kind of agriculture, what kind of uh, vegetation going uh, growing along the terraces. Yeah. So that's what I understood from your question. Um, do you think there are any more applications except uh, maybe for culture? No, in the Zin, there's a lot of agriculture inside the river. Sometimes they do use um, these structures. Do you think there's other applications? Other application in sense of like uh, to identify terraces with yes. the help of OBIE? Yes, yes. Like not not only because you presented you presented a, me a method. And the method is for a certain uh, objective, which is archaeology. Yes. But I'm asking if there are other applications, yes, like for agriculture, and yes. do you know of others that can use it? Yeah, actually, I did uh, two of the work. One is the to estimate the solar uh, solar energy potential over the rooftops in Kiryat Malaki, is right. And other one is to identify the structures of the greenhouses. So that is one of the two applications what I have worked. So I'll maybe in next future we will extend this uh, in this other domain as well. You can apply any way you want. Have time for one more question? Okay. So could I take it? Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. You said uh, I'm, just, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm allowed. Uh, now you said that your main limitation is the pixel size, right? Right? That's one of your main limitations. No, it's like it thing. was a challenge because the width of the uh, terraces, walls, it's really, it's really small. Okay, so yeah, is, that was the... How small is it? When you crack... Okay, is it uniform? Width of the... Yeah. Did you characterize... Two tenths of centimeter. Uh, centimeter. Is it all, yeah, but is it similar in all places? More or less, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So our uh, next talk will be by uh, Daniel Camon from Brandeis University from the US. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, big pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, I'll be discussing, my name is Daniel Camon, and I'll be discussing remote sensing remote sensing techniques for groundwater measurements in dry land subsurface. So, uh, nobody proposed me this topic. I just like it. So I proposed it to my professor and he said, okay, let's go for it. So um, with that, I want to thank um, the committee for choosing this topic today, for inviting me. particular, Muit and Sivan. I'd like to thank uh, my parents for coming here. And my father for inspiring me with uh, his observation. And in particular for the components of water and water management. And uh, with that, I'll say a few words about myself. So I, I studied uh, remote sensing. First, I was engineering in 
the J Jerusalem College of Technology, and I continued with a master's in remote sensing at uh, Northeastern University. And recently, I uh, did research, I'm doing research at Brandeis University with Jonathan on SAR uh, technologies. We're trying to make some optogeometric models in order to try to go deep in the ground. That's what we try to do. And so what is SAR? The SAR is synthetic aperture radar. It's a type of uh, payload, well, can be on satellite or airborne, that is able to penetrate the clouds because they have long enough wavelength. And um, they also have a good um, resolution. Uh, this is due to the fact that they, they use certain principles that we're going to be talking about. And there are many applications today of these uh, of SAR. And I'm going to be talking about the subsurface. So what are we looking for? Well, this is actually an ancient well. So we are looking for water. Incidentally, we just read on the, this weekend, for those who are familiar with it, the section talking about how the our ancestors were looking for water in this uh, very area of the Negev. They actually found water. And uh, this is the reason for the names of many places here in the Negev. For instance, Be'er Sheba, Be'er means a well. And um, they found water. And they were happy about it, of course. Uh, today, we don't have to do the same methods that they were using, looking for greenery or moisture. We can have some technologies that we're going to be discussing. So one application of that is for the Nubian aquifer, for instance. Um, that is drawing water from fossil reservoirs. And uh, although from the surface you may see nothing, according to NASA, the Nubian aquifer is the world's largest fossil water uh, in the world. It covers an estimated area of 2.6 million square kilometers, including parts of Sudan, Chad, Libya, and most of Egypt. Uh, this picture that you see here, of course, it's not a real picture showing that under the sand you can have actually a lot of water. And they actually already use it with the great man-made river. They distribute this fresh water to the coastal cities. Let me step back for a minute. I just want to mention uh, some methods that exist today for detecting subsurface water or moisture. So there are methods that are come from the surface, like sound waves, or electrical signals, or GPR, ground penetra penetrating radar. Um, but we want to be talking about space that is can be uh, can present many advantages to do it from space. So from space, there there is the optical remote sensing. But usually, the I mean it doesn't go so deep in the ground. So usually we we use the radar methods, and there are different radar methods using again different uh, wavelength that can go deeper and, and, and deeper in the ground. There are other methods like um, gravity pull, uh, if you're familiar with the GRACE satellites, but they are very coarse, they have very coarse resolution, about 300 kilometers, which is not very uh, useful for our needs. And there are other magnetic methods, which is, I think, from the surface. So what we want, again, is to be able, from space, to have good penetration, and uh, get some depth resolution, and if possible, finding an effective value of index of refraction n. This is our goal. I want to say a few words about history of, of um, subsurface, just a minute on it. Subsurface people sensing for, um, for 3D mapping, so to speak. So this is good for uh, JPL people, right? So in early 80s, the SAR missions showed that radar signals can penetrate the super superficial sand layer revealing unknown paleohydrological and tectonic structures. Also, previous studies have shown that uh, the L-band SAR is able to penetrate meters of low electrical loss material such as Elion sand. That's why well, we're choosing this for dry land um, mediums. And in 1982, Sir A. L. Ben radar revealed buried 
and previously unknown paleo drainage channels in southwestern Egypt, later confirmed during field expeditions. And appreciate a nice picture in space. Well, in the 90s, sort of sea data were used to map subsurface basin structure to control the Nile's course in the northeastern Sudan. Sudan. Hidden fault were detected, helping to better understand the uplift of the Nubian swell. And new paleo drainage flow directions have been mapped in eastern Sahara. The Japanese Bansar revealed a 1,300 kilometers long paleo river in eastern Libya. You can see here in the first image that we have the difference between a optical image that you see basically nothing except for yellow and you understand that this is sand, but you can see the, um, the radar um, band here in the middle shows much, much more details on the subsurface structure. And, and yeah, and on the, the right, the, the, top, the top, I mean, at the end, you can even see here a uh, clear uh, paleo drainage and uh, a variety of rocks that can be identified. I want to recognize the work that has been done in the, at Ben Gurion University on microwave remote sensing of physically buried objects in the Negev desert and its implications for subsurface Martian exploration. And I had the pleasure to read uh, those articles. And uh, they claim that SAR system using long wavelengths can complement an orbital sounding system and ground penetrating radar in order to obtain an optimal depth penetration, the vertical resolution, and the volumetric local data. See here how they, in 2001, the ESA was making plans for being able to identify on Mars uh, water reservoirs and possible res uh, reservoirs. In 2018, they got some images, I think, from Marsis that uh, have bright radar echoes that suggest liquid water. Uh, you can see here, I don't know if this is really uh, uh, validated. I don't know how they can check this. But in the meantime, they're happy with those echoes. On Earth, we face um, many obstacles. One of them, when we, go, we get to longer wavelength, of the, uh, is the ionosphere plasma, which is very opaque from, from uh, about a wavelength of 20 meters. You can see here on the bottom, uh, you can see that uh, from uh, 10 to about 20 meters becomes very opaque. This is due to the fact that there are three electrons that are born from uh, the uh, 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 sun rays that interact with the atoms and just uh, give some free electrons that they don't let the wavelengths coming in. These also atmospheric absorption, scattering, and noise, although at this wavelength, we're not supposed to have too much of that, but we can't say that we are going to be covered. And uh, there is going to be, for sure, a lot of ground attenuation, absorption, scattering, and noise, especially because we are working on a non-homogeneous geomorphology. And the difference with Mars is Mars is, has a lot less uh, uh, moisture in the ground, and then it's easier to penetrate. And we're going to have some more uh, problems, issues, so to speak, on Earth. There's also the fact that we need uh, long, thick antennas because we are using longer wavelengths, and we will need a lot of power because this is an active system. And uh, also the fact that because on-site methods on Earth are more convenient, uh, that's maybe one of the reasons why it doesn't exist yet, but uh, maybe they'll want to do it soon. Uh, look forward for it. So the idea that we propose is um, this is basically the um, the main idea of this presentation is to do frequency measurements instead of amplitude power measurements or time measurements. This is already done by for by. Uh, NASA and everybody for, I mean, those who work with satellites for um, for getting a good resolution, uh, especially in the azimuth, azimuth uh, resolution, this is the direction of flight. Uh, the advantage of doing frequency measurements is that it's less affected by noise and or attenuation, robust to change in, changes in medium. And that's my, that, is, that may suggest that if we might need less power, and probably get 
a better resolution even in the depth. Now, uh, how do we know that it's more robust to change its medium? So if you're familiar with uh, the fact that when uh, radiation enters a medium, it's known that the wavelength changes and um, the velocity changes, but the frequency does not change. And this is an amazing idea that we can use in order to manipulate or play with the frequency. And that was the, the basic um, idea that pushed me in this direction. And then I said, okay, so now I, I need to translate, uh, for, first of all, we need to use the fact, the dot worship that I'm gonna be talking in a second, but then we're gonna be, we're gonna to have to translate this principle into geometry and to play a little more with geometry. So the principle of the Doppler shift is that when you're sending a signal and you're moving, so you get a feedback with a different frequency. If you are moving towards uh, a target, you're getting a frequency that's higher. And if you're moving uh, away from a target, then you're getting a lower frequency. Now, the good thing is that if you're even, let's say, at a different height, very high, it also can define the angle for you. There is a relationship between the uh, Doppler shift that we get and the actual ang angle of uh, that can be uh, that that is uh, that we are between the velocity the velocity vector and the distance between the antenna and the object. So let's see now how that translates into geometry. So we have to use some principles, the Cartesian principle, and we also use the uh, Fermat principle of least time to in order to develop uh, a model. And uh, you can see over here the target, and we are moving, and we basically are able to get a Doppler shift that is going to define this theta one angle. So after some uh, work with equations, we came to this relationship that um, links the d, the depth that we are looking for, the n, index of refraction of yes, and uh, other measures that are derived from theta that can be found. Basically, we have two unknowns and one equation. This is a problem. We need some more information. So what we can do is, for, for instance, add another antenna at a different height, and we get two angles, and then we get two um, equations. And the solution for each equation would be a graph, and the intersection between those graphs is supposed to be the unique solution for our model. And this is what we find. We find a pretty clear and nice intersection, and which exactly gives us the right D and the right N that we started with, of course, we put it aside in order to use the model, but then we find we are back on our feet and we find the correct measures. And this is great. The only problem is that we are not sure how far apart the antennas have to be. This clear intersection was in the case that are very far apart. We cannot be sure that uh, when they are close, it's going to be the same thing, the same thing. So we wanted to find to make another model. So we made another model with one antenna. This is a pretty nice uh, picture that uh, I made with um, MATLAB. This figure on the left shows that when the antenna is moving to the right, at every step of the flight, we get a different, um, we call this a Doppler cone, meaning an angle in 3D, which defines a Doppler cone. And what we want to analyze here is that along the flight with one single antenna, we get a series of imaginary Doppler cones. We study the limit of the intersection between the Doppler cones and the zero Doppler plane. We assume that we are able to find the length L. So again, we make some equations. We come with a relationship between a D, which is the virtual depth that we are able to find, to see, and the real depth. And uh, this is a problem because if you look at this relationship, I mean, this equation, you see that when we get close to L equals zero, we get uh, the numerator and denominator that tend to be zero. However, we can know according to L'Hospital that there is a limit for this D prime. And uh, we made some simulations where we see 
that we see the convergence of D prime when we tend, when L tends to be zero. But this is not a real depth. In the case, in our case, the real depth that we started with was 100, and we find we converge to 83. With some instability when we get close to, when uh, L is closer to zero, which just makes sense because of the mathematics of the model. And um, it's good, but we want to find D. So what can we do for that? So we show that we can have a relationship between D and D prime zero, which is a D prime when we are as close as possible from the, from the uh, double plane, zero double plane. And we find a nice uh, guess here, N, which wasn't here before. And this uh, ratio, now this ratio, when we are getting closer to, to the zero double plane, tends to be one, which we are left with this nice and simple relationship. However, we don't know N. What can we do in order to know N? And this is the last step of the, uh, of the this presentation. So this is what we can do. We can say that for a given D prime, the zero, there is many ways to come to it along the way from L equals 4,000, for instance, to L equals zero. And depending on the N, we're going to come faster or slower. And for instance, if we take a given L equals, for example, here, 1,000, we, we are able to draw a graph of the D prime at L equals 2,000 in function of the N. And so we can measure the, the D prime, and we have the graph, so we are able to find the correct N. If I go back for a second, we have the, the relationship between D N and D prime zero, we basically now can find the D. To summarize and in conclusion, this is the formula that I didn't show you at the beginning, which links the Doppler shift and the angle, this is known. I didn't show it to you because I was scared that I was going to spend too much time explaining it, but now I can show it to you. And in the first method, we had we came to a uh, pretty directly to a relationship between D and uh, and theta, which is here in terms of x and, and gamma one, and but with two antennas. The other methods use only one antenna, but it's even more implicit. Some remarks and future steps. Uh, we consider here the medium to be homogeneous with only one single n, which is probably not the truth. And we have to work on that, but this is just the beginning of the work. Also, our model is based on the value of L, the distance between the antenna and the zero double plane. We are still good enough resolution in a this direction, even in the subsurface. We're not sure about it. We need to consider the sensitivity of the models to noise. And also, we need to check that star resolution for Zimus can be can also be verified from the depth. And we look forward to getting real data. I would really appreciate if anybody has some good connections in this field, or if you want to work with me, I'll be more than happy. In the meantime, I want to thank my uh, professor, Jonathan. We are together here on campus, and we believe that uh, this work and uh, has much more uh, scope than just identifying the, the level of the groundwater, but can also be used for desert uh, agriculture, development, management, for uh, natural resources management and for climate change and anything else that you like. Thank you very much for listening. We have time for questions. Okay, we have time for questions. Yes, yeah. so in about 14 months, uh, NASA and the Indian Space uh, Research Organization are going to launch satellite called NISAR. It's going to be L-band uh, over the planet and S-band over uh, Indian subcontinent. Um, and it's going to generate an enormous amount of, of data um, every day. Uh, and a lot of that will be put into the cloud to, to operate on. There's lots of Jupiter but no books out there to do things. I think, uh, you know, you're going to have more data than you know what to do with to be able to uh, you know, test this model. Uh, the, the challenge, obviously, um, in any of this is the verification. Same time, there are 
there are many places across the world where there are um, water level networks and, and wells and things like that. Uh, so, you know, applying it in areas where there are you know, well networks would be uh, hopefully NISAR will go up without a hitch and within three to four months, the data will become generating in massive quantities. So look toward uh, getting funding from NASA. And actually, since you're, you know, one, if you get into a PhD program, there is a next uh, February, there is a uh, NASA uh, graduate student fellowship headline. I can point that to you. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are you, what's your name again? Iran. 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 Yeah. So at Rochester Institute of Technology, RIT, they have Cuban SARS on the, on drones. And uh what, what band, sorry? Cuban. What the way I don't know, I'm not the SAR person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you, if you need the connection there, I can Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. There is a global model that was published by Fallon Martinez, 2010 in science in science. And they did water table, global water table model for they one kilometer scale. What on Earth? Yeah, they so updated it like two years ago. So wow, twelve years ago. Uh, so six, what's the model of that? Yeah. You need to look at exactly how they did that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so is there <laughs> any influence of uh, salinity on your measurement? The influence is probably on what the, the type of feedback we get. Uh, but this is already about identification, which is more related maybe to polarization or something like that. What I'm doing is after we have identified what we have, for let's say we know this is water because we have uh, such a polarization. So then we want to make uh, uh, spatial measurements. That's uh, but I'm not aware of it, but it could be, who knows. Any last questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, before we go after this, the Professor Elmaster, Mason Stahl from the Union College. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me here today. My name is Mason Stahl. And to continue kind of off of Daniel's very nice talk, we're going to just move up, as was just mentioned, into the very shallow uh, moisture at the surface. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, colleague Kagan, um, my co-author on this work. So today I'm going to talk to you about the seasonal cycle of surface soil moisture. We're going to look at a global characterization and then think about applications to soil quality. So just a quick outline of my talk today. All right, I'm going to be discussing the seasonal cycle of surface soil moisture. It's a real mouthful to say. And um, so I want to start off with a quick overview of what is surface soil moisture? Why do we care about it? And then also, why do we care about the seasonal cycle? And then I'm gonna talk about the work that we've done where we've actually taken a long time series, global observations of surface soil moisture, and then identify the, a set of distinct kind of seasonal cycle regimes or seasonal patterns. And then we also, once we identify these kind of unique um, seasonal patterns that exist around the world, we then identify well, what controls the emergence of one seasonal cycle over another. So what are the key Climatological factors that lead to one cycle versus another. And then I'm going to wrap up the talk today with some discussion of broader implications, both for soil quality, both in drylands and really more generally in all, all kind of uh, environments on Earth. Okay, so I want to kick off with what is surface soil moisture? So we're looking here at a nice kind of cross section into the Earth's critical zone. So that's the zone from treetops to the top of bedrock. And if you look really at this top skin there, the very surface, those upper five centimeters of the soil, the moisture in there is called surface soil moisture. And it's strongly correlated the amount of surface soil moisture to what's called root zone soil moisture, which is the upper one meter. So why do we care about this? If we think about exchanges of energy and water um, between the land surface and the lower atmosphere, really two key parameters are, are state variables that we care about. We care about land surface temperature 
and we care about surface soil moisture. And those control fluxes of water and energy. So it's really important for the Earth's climate. It's really important for the Earth's water cycle. But it controls a whole host of other processes too, right? So the, the surface soil moisture provides water for vegetation. So it controls primary productivity in large part, and then thus carbon cycle and other nutrient cycles. And so any seasonal cycle in soil moisture is going to impart a seasonal cycle on energy fluxes, water fluxes, carbon uh, fluxes, and primary production. So if we think about both drylands and areas outside of drylands, there's a whole host of other processes that are influenced by soil moisture in a seasonal cycle. So heat waves are affected. Dry soils heat up real fast. Wet soils heat up much slower. Drought, uh, of course, unsurprisingly, is affected by soil moisture in a seasonal cycle. Wildfires, right? When soils are dry, vegetation becomes dry, and then fire risk increases. So the duration of dry periods and their seasonal timing is going to affect the risk for wildfire and when wildfires might occur. Soil salinization, that's controlled, really the salt budget of a soil is controlled by its water balance, in large part. And so thinking about the balance between evaporative fluxes and drainage fluxes and their seasonal patterns is going to affect soil salinization. And then flooding. So some very recent work has shown that for a given storm event, the key control on how intense a flood is and its timing really depends on antecedent surface soil moisture conditions. So there's a lot of applications here, both drylands and outside. And so the research questions I'm going to talk to you about today, first research question is, well, how do seasonal cycles of surface soil moisture vary around the globe? And so somewhat surprisingly, before we did this work, that had not been characterized. And so you, you think about most climatological or meteorological variables like precipitation, land surface temperature, sea surface temperature, we know they're seasonal cycles. But uh, somewhat surprisingly, that was unknown. What are the dominant cycles, if any, and how do they vary around the globe? So that's the first task that we tackled. And then the second research question I'm going to talk to you about today is once we've identified these different seasonal cycles, well, what's going to control why one cycle emerges over another cycle? And so we tackled that question. We said, well, what are these factors that give rise to each of the different unique seasonal cycles that we reserve, uh, observe. Okay, so let's look at my first research question, which is how do seasonal cycles of surface soil moisture vary across the globe? So the approach we used here was we took observed soil moisture conditions. So long-term time series data. Um, we analyzed this data, right? We then classified it and based on the seasonal patterns using an unsupervised clustering approach to identify what distinct regimes exist. And so I'm going to step you through that, the methods and our approach, and then the results in their applications. Because of step one, right? We want to analyze surface soil moisture. We need to get data. And so we obtained global coverage of surface soil moisture data from the, the NASA SMAP, or Soil Moisture Active Passive Satellite. So this satellite's been operating since 2015 and continuously to, through today. And what's really great about it is it has a return period of three or four days to any given location on Earth. So we get sub-weekly surface soil moisture data, and it's at a, uh, a fairly good you know, spatial resolution. The pixels are 36 kilometers by 36 kilometers. So now we have over six years of sub-weekly sur soil surface, uh, surface soil moisture data for the globe. And so our goal, right, is to understand the seasonal dynamics. I'm going to show you our approach, kind of which we did on a pixel by pixel basis. And I'll step through. So you can imagine we had 40,000 pixels that met the, our data criteria. And so I'm going to step you through what it hypothetically looks like, and then I'll uh, and you'll see what we did. So our goal, right, understand the seasonal cycle. And so this um here, you can see this panel. This is a time series of surface soil moisture. You can see we have many years of data, and we care about the seasonal dynamics, not the between years. You can imagine slicing a long many year time series into its constituent years and sort of stacking them on top of one another. And you can see, okay, yeah, there's a clear seasonal cycle here. Well, what we then want to do is we want to get a composite value. We don't want six or seven different values for each day of the year. So we take an average, basically every single week of the year. So like the first week of the year, we take all the data for that first week across many years, average it. Then week one through 52, we do that. And we get a single kind of typical annual cycle for an individual pixel. So we do this for every single pixel. Now, our goal here is, okay, this is great. We see there's a seasonal cycle here, but I'd really like to compare across pixels. And I want to know, well, what are the other, is there one dominant cycle, five dominant cycles, 500 dominant cycles that occur across the earth? 
And I, of course, can't classify these many tens of thousands of pixels by hand. So I need a quantitative metric that describes the actual form or shape of every single pixel seasonal pattern. And so what we do is we apply an approach called functional data analysis. Basically, you take a, a superposition or a sum of many B spline fits, and you get a continuous function to represent every single pixel seasonal pattern. And so we ultimately get we, the, our approach. We have eight coefficients that then describes the form and shape of every single pixel's um, seasonal cycle. And so we have that in information. We have eight coefficients. And now we've taken a very high dimensional data and reduced it to eight uh, dimensions for each pixel. So then what we need to do is, well, I want to compare across pictures. What are, what are the patterns, if any, that emerge? And so we apply k-means clustering. So every single pixel has eight um, coefficients. There's 40,000 pixels. So we then cluster and we see, and, and remember these coefficients describe the shape or the, of, of each of the pixels function, um, um, seasonal cycles. So then we cluster and we see, is there some, are there some consistent shapes or seasonal patterns that emerge? And lo and behold, there were. So we found there were five distinct surface soil moisture regimes that emerge globally. And so I'm going to step you through, there's a lot of information on the slide. I'm going to step you through what we see. So if you look at this part, let's just look at panel one. So there's five different seasonal cycles that are dominant. The x-axis is the month of the year. The y-axis is the surface soil moisture content. And so if you look, there's a bunch of black lines on that, on that panel. So every pixel, you know, the many thousands of pixels that have this seasonal cycle, I'm showing each of the, the pixels that fall into, that were classified by our machine learning approach to fall into category one, the, their pixels are shown as black lines. So that's why we have a bunch of those black lines. And then the heavy colored line is the average across all of those pixels in that cluster. And so you can see here, if we look at this, this kind of seasonal cycle, it's sort of a wettish winter and then a dry summer and, you know, back to a wet winter. So dry summer, wet winter. And you can see there's many different cycles. I want to highlight one other key thing. You might be wondering why are there two rows of months? And that's because we took all the data in the Southern Hemisphere. And so it would line up with the Northern Hemisphere. We shifted all the data in the summer, Southern Hemisphere by six months. That way we can compare across winter to winter, summer to summer across hemisphere. So let me step you through each of these regimes. And remember, this is all observed SMAP data. These are observations. Okay, so let's look at the regime one that I just mentioned. And I, I just describe it as a muted summer minimum and a muted some, uh, winter maximum. And we can see about 15% of the, uh, category, uh, the Earth's surface falls into that category. And we've got it dominant in the Eastern United States, Southern Australia, Western and Northern Europe and parts of the Middle East, including most of Israel. Regime two has a very distinctive and different regime. This has a pronounced long duration peak in surface soil moisture that occurs during the summer months, right? We can see a very wet summer and it pro pro uh, uh, prolonged. And so we can see where does this occur mostly? So there's a very notable band sandwich between the Sahel and the Congo. And so kind of coming right along here and then Southeast Asia as well, parts of Central Africa, um, and then scattered in a few other locations. Regime three is a much more subdued kind of seasonal cycle. It has a very light peak in, from spring to autumn in surface soil moisture. And so we can see that occurs in, you know, almost on all continents. And uh, so we can see that there. Regime four, this is another unique regime. This is where we have a very pronounced peak in surface soil moisture that occurs in the summer months. And so we can see where does that happen? So we see right, this, strong, this nice strong peak, but it's much more focused time. And so it happens right in this band in the Sahel, Northern Australia, much of Northern India, um, and then also parts of uh, Mexico and, so, and South America. And then the most common regime that we found, so of the pixels that we, of the 40,000 pixels that we were able to classify, um, about half of them fall into no seasonal cycle at all. So they're aseasonal. And they tend to be in either areas that are really dry and always dry or really wet and always wet, but most dominantly really dry. So you can see much of Australia desert, much of the Arabian Peninsula, North Africa, Western United States, Southern Africa, among other places. Okay, so here's our global map now based on all observations, just our analysis and classification of observed soil moisture data. Right, and we can see there's some clear spatial patterns here. There's some clear coherence in the data. 
But then it begs the question, okay, why, why do these different regimes emerge? Why does regime one emerge as opposed to regime two or regime three in a given location? And so that leads me to our second question. Right? What is controlling the emergence of a given surface soil moisture seasonal cycle? And so what was the approach we took? So what we wanted to, what we did here was we developed a simplified and physically based model of surface soil moisture. And then with that model, right, that's, uh, that's uh, physically based, we then compared it against the observations that I just showed you from SMAP. And if our model does well, and it's, it's forced or driven by some climatological variables, if our model can accurately reproduce, op reproduce observations, then we know that our model is capturing the physics here, is capturing what really controls that. So let's step through how we do this. Okay, so we need a, we want to model surface soil moisture. And so we constructed a water balance. So you can see here, this is a nice kind of um, a reference volume of soil. And we, let's think about the water budget here, right? Water can come in via precipitation. It can leave via evapotranspiration or drainage, either laterally or vertically. So let's build our water balance equation. You don't need to follow the equation fully. I'm gonna just step you through the key salient points that I want you to take away. So the left-hand side of the equation is the change in stored soil and moisture with time. And that's, of course, going to be equal to the inflows minus the outflows. So precipitation minus evaporation minus Q, which is just the sum of our two drainage terms. Okay, but we want to solve this equation, right? We want to actually be able to model soil moisture. So we want data that's widely available in space and in time. So precipitation, that's easy to get globally gridded. Um, evaporation is harder and drainage is harder. So we have to make some simplifying assumptions. So what do we do? We say, well, evaporation... We can approximate that as PET, that's much easier to obtain potential evaporation than actual, as a product of PET and the surface soil moisture content. Mm -hmm. And then the lateral, the drainage, the total drainage, again, that's not really a data set to obtain that information, but we said, well, let's approximate it reasonably as the antecedent soil moisture conditions and precipitation. Okay. And then we do one last step. We say, well, as our volume, our thickness goes to zero, because we're thinking about a very thin layer of the Earth's surface, we end up it, being able to rearrange and solve for the soil saturation. And if you look at this, those of you who have seen an aridity index before, this is very similar to a, it's a modified aridity index. It's basically the ratio of precipitation over the ratio of PET and precipitation, the sum of those two. And so this is great because those are really easy data to obtain globally and through time. But we took one further simplification, right? Precip is great. We can get that. PET is typically a model-derived product. And so there's some recent work that showed that PET can be very accurately represented by downwelling um, uh, surface uh, uh, shortwave uh, surface radiation. And so we actually apply that because that's more of like an astronomical variable, much easier to get and have both at present and going back in history. And so now we have a model. Our, so our soil moisture model that has only two climatological inputs, the downwelling shortwave radiation and precipitation. And so how does this model perform? That's the key question, right? If our model can accurately reproduce observed conditions, then we can say, okay, these two variables, these are the two key knobs or two key controls on what controls the monthly soil moisture um, and the emergence of different regimes. So let's see how our model actually performs against observations. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna show you that regime one. If you remember, we looked at that regime one. And so if you look up here in the top left panel, the, uh, the observed data for regime one is shown as the black heavy line, right? It's the dry summers, winter, winters. And our model values for all the pixels, the average across all the pixels is shown in green. And so that really simple physically based soil moisture model that we made, is very faithfully reproducing the observed conditions. So this is saying, okay, our model captures the behavior. And then you can see the bottom panel here is showing our inputs to the model, just the climatic forcings that we use, namely precipitation and solar radiation, which then we convert to a PET estimate. Okay, so this is great. We see a, the, the climatic cycle that, emer that drives the actual observed cycle. Okay, so we did this for the extratropics. And then let's look at the tropics. And so the observed cycle should be basically identical, right? It falls into this cluster one with dry summers, wet winters. And our model does pretty well again here. But what's interesting is we see a very different climate forcing that uh, generates that same exact seasonal cycle of soil moisture. Okay, so that's for just that first regime. Now I'm going to put all the regimes up here. And again, it's going to be a lot of panels. You don't need to follow every panel, but I want you to, I'll step you through the key things I want you to see. 
Okay, so let's look here uh, at the extra tropics for seasonal cycles one through five. And then this is the tropics, also seasonal cycles one through five. So the black line, remember, that's the SMAP observed data. And so the black lines between the tropics and extra tropics, if you're in a given cycle, like cycle one, they're going to look basically the same. Cycle two look basically the same. So I want you to first look, how did our model do across different seasonal cycles and across different regime, uh, uh, regions, tropics and extra tropics? So let's compare our model output, the green lines, the black line. You can see that across the different seasonal cycles, our model performs really well. And then across the extra tropics and the tropics, again, our green lines match the observed black lines. So our simple physically based model that's driven by two inputs, monthly precipitation, monthly downwelling shortwave solar radiation, accurately models soil moisture. And so then one last thing I want you to see is look at the climate forcings that drive the different regimes. Those vary around the world. So that's kind of a cool thing. We can see that for a given seasonal cycle in soil moisture, you can have very different climates that can ultimately result in the exact same soil moisture um, cycle. Okay, so this takes me to my conclusions. So first conclusion, we, uh, we, we took our uh, observed SMAP data, right? And we found that there are five dominant cycles of soil moisture uh, seasonal cycles that are actually observed globally, right? The second thing we found, that spatial variability in the seasonal cycle of soil moisture is very well explained by a very simple, physically-based soil moisture model. Um, and then we also saw that you can get the exact same seasonal cycle in soil moisture, but for very different re reasons in different places. So two different climate cycles can result in the same seasonal cycle in soil moisture. So that's why we see these seasonal cycles emerging around the globe. Okay, so if you want to read more about that, you can get it in that paper there um, that, uh, that uh, my colleague Kagan and I just pu published. Um, and now I just want to quickly talk about the broader implications. And that, that's this paper uh, thing there too. Okay, so the broader implications, both the dry lands and beyond. So what's really, I think there's a lot of cool places to take this in the future. So one is thinking about soil chemistry and soil quality. So a lot of the work I do is actually in groundwater quality. And so I was thinking, you know, one thing that's really important to think about here is the water balance of soils controls their salinity and their pH. And so arid regions tend to have very high pH or basic soils, but there are some notable exceptions to that. Parts of the Sahel have acid soils. And so it could just be because they're getting, you saw in the Sahel, we have that peak in the summer in soil moisture. And so they might get really well drained, even though it's a dry area. And so you can think how that might affect the seasonal cycle here is may be as important or more important than the annual average, right? Because it, you can have two places with the same annual average, but very different seasonal dynamics. Soil redox conditions is another important thing. Soils that are wet go, go anoxic. Soils that are dry can become oxic. The cycling between those can dissolve iron oxides and other uh, and contaminants attached to them, as uh, well, well as breakdown of carbon. So that takes me to my next point. The carbon cycling in a, in a soil uh, a couple key, there are a lot of climatic and environmental controls, but the seasonal cycle of soil moisture, right, might control whether or not it's microbially degraded, right? So um, moist soils will have high microbial activity. If they become moist for part of the year, vegetation grows, and then if it becomes dry, there's herbivores that can eat it. And if they're really dry soils, it might be largely cycled by fire. Um, okay, so the carbon cycling might depend on that. The, the biome emergence. So if we think about, right, Two places that have the same annual average climate, same annual average precip, annual average temperature, they might have very different biomes. One could be a grassland, one could be a forest. And so it might be because of different seasonality and soil moisture and water availability to vegetation that could shift one to a grassland, one to a forest. Groundwater recharge, that's another area that could be influenced here, the, the timing of soil moisture peaks. And then I think a cool way to take this too in the future is to think about Soil moisture data, we have these great satellites now, uh, but that only goes back to 2015. And unlike things like stream flow and even groundwater levels, soil moisture measurements in the field, especially historically, are very sparse, right? So some wells will have me measurements going back over 100 years, but very few measurements of soil moisture. But what's cool is that our very simple physically based model needs two inputs, monthly precip and solar radiation. And both of those we can get going back you know, decades and often hundreds of years in places. Um, so that's another application. And so uh, uh, with that, I'll wrap up. And if there's time for questions, I'm happy. Thank you. Oh, 
So I thought it was really interesting that you removed clouds because that's probably, you know, that's one of the, the biggest challenges in um, modeling of climate, modeling of weather and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, and so could you say a little bit more about why that's a reasonable approximation? You mean the... Is it when you're taking uh, you know, PET is some uh, linear function of uh, or solar radiation? radiation. Yeah. Uh, so this is the not top of atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, and so why it's a reasonable approximation? Well, you, you're not taking top of atmosphere, yeah. you're taking below. So how are you getting uh, factoring in the, the cloud component there? That's a good. So I did not. I, I used a uh, TerraClim data for the uh, solar radiation. And uh, I don't actually know what they're doing in that. And that's a good question. Um, and it's something I, uh, yeah, so I, I can't comment too much specifically on that. I, 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 don't, I don't know specifically, but it's a good question. It's something to think about because it performs well without me, me having done anything specifically on that. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, to, to continue this thread. So now we, we can simulate uh, radiation flux, they're very high accuracy. Uh -huh. Take into account, you know, slope and aspect. If it's a vegetated area, what's what's the altitude and uh, 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 a lot of parameters we can get can get you a very accurate estimate, global estimate of that. <laughs> so the question is like, okay, so say say that happens, how much more average would you get for your models? Like uh, because it's uh, it already seems to be working pretty well. So. Yeah. That's a great comment and question. I don't know how much better it would get. Um, yeah. I'm sure it would improve. Uh, yeah. I honestly had not considered the role of cloud. Like I hadn't really thought about it much, but it's yeah. a good area for me. To and uh, and another thing, if you if you consider soil type, uh, so, so for example, especially soils with iron oxide, yeah, going to absorb much more energy. Yeah. Uh, in the in the flank curve of the sun, full of uh, the overlaying. Yeah. So there's been a lot of more absorption into the, into the soil uh, compared with you know maybe clay soil that's kind of whiter and this good like everything. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's another point. And uh, so one other uh, thing I wanted to say. Yeah. She showed us those kind of seasonal seasonal spectra I would call them or it's like it's like uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So if we consider number five. Yeah. You said it, it could happen for both soils that are all, always wet yeah. or always dry. Yeah. But soils that are always dry, especially in this area where we're at, yeah. you can get like 50 or 40 millimeters of rain yeah. like in one event. Sure. So, so in this case, you might be missing, missing that feature. Yes. Yeah, so you know, that... Because when it's wet, it's always wet. Yeah. If you dry, it could be like one day or two days or... So wait, yeah. you're that's not, you're 100 right. This is not going to pick up sub monthly flashiness, which yeah. which would be relevant for like, yeah. um, and that's because the so we're using just well the, the SMAP data could theoretically it's three or four day return period, yeah. but our model so this is the observations I'm showing. Our model was just for the monthly average. Yeah. Um, I don't know, and and I mentioned I kind of sped through it. But when we were developing our model, I shrunk the thickness to yeah. zero. So I could, yeah. as a mathematical approximation, that means there's no memory in time. And there would be on a five days time, like time frame, yeah. but it wouldn't be probably on a monthly time frame. And so that allowed us solve the model. But um, but that's a, a good also point. Also, you won't know. So it could be like in, in the winter season, but could yeah. be the beginning all of the ranges, you know, in, in, in a week or the end of the season. Yeah. So it won't maybe track your kind of analysis. Here. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Go. Two more talks, and we are um, lifting up for the runoff and uh, water on the on the surface now, not the uh, in the surface. Um. We'd like to for the Dr. Yael Stoltz parents from the Israel Water Authority. Well, thank you very much. I think Mason, um, Mason, I think we'll have a lot to talk about yeah. after this talk. 
Um, I want to first apologize. Um, in the abstract, I focused on arid regions, but um, after thinking about it again, I realized that um, the challenges are the same challenges uh, in all the countries. So I decided to stay on a national level. Um, as uh, Sivan presented, my name is Yael. I'm the head of the Surface Water and Hydrometeorology Department in the Hydro Hydrological Service in the Water Authority. And today I came to present uh, our National Flood Forecasting Center. And we refer to it as the Intelligence for Disaster Management. I hope, uh, I hope you understand why during the talk. So it's important to understand that we are still under an establishment process. Prior to 2018, uh, there was still some form of forca informal forecast. But after the Tafit strategy, there was a decision made in 2019 in order to establish our forecasting center. We got the responsibility, we didn't really get the resources. So we could only manage with what we had, started to operate the center only partially. Same time, we started with the global survey with other forecasting centers around the world to understand how do they operate, how are they built, what kind of models do they use, how do they disseminate their forecasts, and so on. And then by 2021, we already became fully operated. That means we give service 24-7 during the uh, a rain event. Just today, we were in a rain event, um, giving service the entire night, and uh, also working on establishment work plan. This work plan helped us to get the funding that we needed, and including the manpower required to operate uh, the flood forecasting center. So now that we finally got the resources. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that by 2024, things will be not completely different. So, of course, the main and most important objective of a flood forecasting center is to save lives, minimize the damage to infrastructure and to property, by enhancing the disaster management capacity of the national agencies by being their intelligence. And we do so by disseminating early floods forecasts and warning, support the civil protection agencies, and of course, we monitor and update in real time. The main principle of operating such a center is to have a very strong collaboration between the meteorological service and the hydrological service. The meteorological service provides us with the rain forecasts. Their output becomes the input to the hydrological model. And then the output of the hydrological models are the flood forecasts. So in order to get the flood forecast, it needs to be a good collaboration to get a good process um, for, for the forecast. These are the main models we work with. Um, the EFAS is a European model, and the FFGS is a global model. Both of them are not fully adapted to our requirements in the Israeli basins, uh, nor to the um, um, climate here. And we are working with these agencies in order to improve. They're getting data from us, and hopefully we'll get an improved model from them and, and use them uh, better. The Hydro and the HEC HMS, both models are well known but they're developed in-house in the hydrological service. The hydro uh, is for the entire uh, basins in the entire country, and the HEC HMS is uh, focused only on the West Coast. There are differences between the models, but most of them share the same components. First, we have to start with the rain. You get or forecasted precipitations or measured precipitation. It depends uh, where in the model um, and uh, how long forward are we modeling for. The surface characteristics are super important because we need to understand what happens once the raindrop fell on the ground, where will it go? And the soil moisture, which is also very important, in order to understand if the rain that fell 
was uh, infiltrated or run up to them. This is the output of the models on the left side. On the left side, we can see an output of several models. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. We see the output of several models over here. Okay. The uh, black.